Well, we certainly are appreciative of all the things that you've written. I do want to focus a little bit on your latest book, The Case for Keto, which I found to be absolutely fascinating. And you made a few really key points in there that I don't think has ever really been made or touched upon. And I know you've talked about the subject so much. Um, and I would love to talk about some of the points that I came across in the book that I thought were super fascinating. The first one really is how you addressed the audience in the case for keto, and you use specifically the phrase, those of us who fatten easily. And I'm curious, like, why did you decide to make that distinction and write the book for that population of people? And who does that include? Um, well, when you think about it, and I've done nothing but think about it for 20 years now, the um, conventional dietary therapy for the past 100 years is basically derived from the way that lean people eat and exercise. So if you're lean and you maintain a healthy weight relatively easily, uh, you assume that everyone could do the same if they did exactly what you did. So what you end up with and what's happened in this country, well, in the world is that we've ended up, uh, lean people tend to assume that it's relatively easy to stay lean. It is for them, and they assume they eat in moderation and exercise in moderation. And if everybody ate in moderation, everybody would remain lean. So we get this weight loss, sort of the idea of uh, um, Michael Pollan encapsulated in his mantra, you know, eat food, uh, not too much, mostly plants. The not too much means if we just eat not too much, we will remain lean. And what people never realized, I mean, some obesity researchers did a uh, hundred years ago, and then this was kind of lost in the, in the history of the field, is that people who gain weight, those of us who fatten easily, and those of us who don't might be sort of different types of people. So if you know, those of us who fatten easily try to eat like lean people do, but it fails. I mean, some of us, you know, there are people out there who have never tried to uh, hold back their appetites, who have never tried to eat less or go the day avoiding snacks and treats and skipping desserts. I mean, I'm assuming there are people out there who just eat whatever they want. But for the most part, you know, everyone tries to eat less if they're gaining weight. It's a kind of a natural phenomenon. You start gaining weight, you try to fight it. But it for those of us who fatten easily, it fails and we have to eat differently than lean people. So this idea is we've been getting lean people diet advice, which works for them, but doesn't work for us. Um, virtually all of the diet advice we get, even in the, the huge epidemiologic studies where they determine what healthy people eat. So they look at people who are lean and healthy, and then they follow them for 20 years, say this is like the nurse's health study at Harvard, which is the most famous. And after 20 years, you, you look and see who's remained lean and healthy. And you look at what those people eat compared to the people who have gained weight. And you find that the people who remained lean and healthy tend to eat fruits, vegetables, and whole grains and not too much of it and legumes and all the other diet advice you've been given. And that's what you tell everyone to do, assuming that if the people who gained weight did that, they would have remained lean also. And then the argument is that's not the case. The problem is, you know, some of us just put on fat easily, the way some breeds of animals fatten easily and some species of animals fatten easily. A, a metaphor I like is you can imagine the world is you know, there are, there are greyhounds and there are basset hounds or mastiffs. And the greyhounds go around thinking if they could just get the basset hounds to run around a track like they do, the basset hounds would look like greyhounds. And they don't. When you end up, if you run a basset hound around a track a few times, you don't end up with a greyhound. You end up with an emaciated, exhausted basset hound. You know, it's like our predisposition to gain weight or not tells us what we have to eat if we want to fight it. And then it, you know, comes down ultimately, if I'm right to carbohydrates and the carbohydrate content of the diet. Yeah, interesting. You, I mean, you do such a great point um, talking about these studies that are done and what you're talking about that, you know, that studies, when you ask people what they eat, you start to make assumptions based on, you know, a food frequency questionnaire, which right off the bat, they're so horrible. If you've ever seen one, it's like, check how many times you have eaten either a full apple or half a can of apples, 
you know, once a week, you know, once a day, twice a day, like it's absolutely ridiculous. And then to make conclusions from that, you, you just absolutely can't do that. It's not possible, right? Well, that's true. But even if they could, this is what the epidemiologists don't like people like me to say, even if they could, they would have, this is when you hear this argument, association is not causality or association does not imply causality or the people who really don't understand this will say association does not necessarily imply causality. It just never does. So here's an example. Imagine you were studying again, physical activities, easy to imagine. You could imagine that people who are dying of cancer are completely inactive, right? They're bedridden. So you can measure it perfectly. These people don't move. The people who are not dying of cancer are walking around exercising, but there's, the, there's no causality there. It's not like the people are healthy because they're exercising and the people who are dying of cancer are lying in bed because they're not exercising. You know, it's sort of, you never know what's cause and what's effect and what else that you're not looking at might be influencing what's cause and what's effect. So even if you could measure our diets perfectly, you don't actually get causal information from that data. You only what you learn is what healthy people eat, not why they're healthy. And you learn what unhealthy people, so even back, you go back to the 1980s, um, there were studies showing that people who tended to be, you know, suffer from obesity or overweight, at least reported that they ate less sugar than people who were lean. Well, if you're lean, you can drink a Coca-Cola, right? Nobody, first of all, nobody criticizes you for drinking a Coca-Cola if you're lean. And second of all, if the Coca-Cola isn't making you fat, then why not drink it? They happen to be delicious. If you're overweight or obese or you're struggling with your weight, then you know you shouldn't be drinking Coke. You should be drinking a nothing else diet Coke. So you've got what's called reverse causality. Because you're gaining weight, that's changed what you consume in such a way that you're trying to stop it. But when you do these studies, you don't see any of that. All you see is that back then it was lean people consume more sugar than people who struggle with their weight, or at least they report consuming more sugar. It's possible that people who struggle with their weight don't want to admit that they're having dessert and drinking three Coca-Colas a day because they kind of think that people will judge them based on that. If you're lean, you never get judged on what you're eating, right? So you're also going to report what you eat differently because you're not worried about people, you know, uh, making assumptions about your willpower, or your character. So these studies sort of on a very profound level can't do what the nutrition research community has been trying to make them do. And they're kind yeah. of aware of that, but simultaneously, they also know that if they acknowledge it fully, then they put themselves out of business and render meaningless their entire careers. And most of us aren't capable of acting in that way. Yeah, no, it's such an important point, and it's important for people to understand that because that's not what shows up on the headline. Like you want to dig through a study, you'll you'll find that stuff and you'll learn this stuff eventually. But it's it's that headline that just grabs people's attention and, and says that red meat is bad for you or causes cancer or you know, all the different claims we hear. You know, every few months it seems like a new headline pops up. And, and again, you can dissect this the studies, but it not many people do. They just see the you know USA Today headline and, and go all in. Not only, it's, it's sort of worse than that. Um, I just had a friend, let me see if I could find this, then just about a half an hour ago, an article from The Guardian, which is you know a British paper that's very thoughtful and has some terrific writing and terrific reporting. And the headline was, vegan diets are healthier and safer for dogs, a study suggests. And this is written by their environmental <laughs> editor. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> and what these people do is they survey dog owners and they ask them what they write and uh, what they what they feed their dogs. And it turns out that people who feed their dogs vegan diets tend to assume that they, you know, they, their dogs go to the vets less often and they appear they have less health complaints about their dogs so therefore the survey suggests that vegan diets are healthier that's the headline that suggested the article the guy who wrote the article has already decided that meat consumption is bad for the environment and meat consumption is bad for our health based on other similar studies so the problem is you imagine um, that you have ethical issues with uh, 
consuming animal products, which I completely understand and can relate to and, you know, admire people who can live by that ethical standard, which I can't. Um, so you've, you've changed your diet and now you're feeding your dog, which is at best an omnivore and is descended from carnivores, a vegan diet. And you can imagine 10,000 people start feeding their dogs vegan diets. And after five years, 2,300 of them, the number in the study are still feeding them vegan diets. The other uh, 7,700 found that their dogs were not thriving on these diets and went back to feeding them what they had fed them all along because the dogs didn't do well. But now when you do the survey, the only people who are still feeding their dogs vegan diets are the ones whose dogs are still healthy. Then there's also a sort of if your dog isn't healthy on the diet and you keep your dog on the diet, that's a pretty, you're not a very responsible pet owner. So there's a strong dynamic to drive you away from the diet if your dog does not happen to be thriving. So you have no idea what the risk benefit analysis really is. You only have this snapshot of the people who are still feeding their dogs vegan diets and are reporting that the dogs are healthy because there aren't that many people who are going to report and I'm feeding my dog a vegan diet and it's like lying on the floor twitching um, and you know hasn't had a bowel movement the last 47 times I took it for a hike or anything like that. On the other hand, they will report when they the dog is doing well. So there's a selection bias in that way. The, you simply cannot the only way to establish this kind of information in any kind of reliable way is to do a clinical trial, a randomized trial where you find, take 5,000 pet owners with 5,000 dogs and you randomize 2,500 of them to eat a vegan diet, 2,500 of them to eat a uh, equally healthy diet that has animal products in it. And then you follow them for a few years to see how the dogs do and you'll learn something meaningful. And the fact that the Guardian's environment editor doesn't understand this is profoundly depressing from a science journalism point of view. <laughs> I mean, wow. I am stunned that somebody who's gotten to the point of being like an editor at the Guardian would write up data like this. And yet, it gets published. So the counter argument is who's Taubes? What is, why should we believe him? The PLOS, which is a relatively respected, well-respected journal published this article. Therefore they must know better than I do. It's a crazy world. Wow, it really is. That's yeah. insane. I mean, you talk about in your book, you know, all these nutritional authorities and how they failed us over the years. And, and one of those ways that we talk about that they have failed us is the, the equation that most of us know, which is calories in, calories out. I see it every time I pass a Coca-Cola vending machine. Um, we've already mentioned them a few times, so hopefully they can monetize our podcast. Maybe they'll be a sponsor. That'd be great. Uh, but the, every time you pass the vending machines, it says balance what you eat, drink, and do. And we talk about the calories in, calories out equation as a great way to lose weight. So people need to exercise, you know, 250 calories more a day. They need to eat 250 calories less every single day. That's 500 calories difference. If you did that for seven days, that's 3,500 calories, which equals one pound. So you just do that until, you know, you have weeks that, that, you know, that have run out because you've lost all the pounds you needed to lose. And you make an excellent point in your book about the difference you know, if we're looking at that equation, uh, the difference over the course of 10, 20 years, if somebody is over consuming their, you know, their energy expenditure by just 20 calories, can you explain the point that you're trying to make when you're talking about such a teeny tiny amount of calories, if that balances off how somebody can become obese? Yeah, okay, so this is, um, and by the way, this is in, in reading the medical literature, I, I first saw this discussed in a uh, textbook called Basal Metabolism and Health and Disease that was published in, I think it was 1924 or so, first edition by Eugene Dubois, who was then the leading metabolism researcher in the United States. So this is like the seminal textbook in metabolism and disease published in the 1920s. Um, and he points this out, this is in the first paragraph of the book. So we think about, you know, in order to maintain a healthy way, we have to balance our intake to expenditure and we measure that by calories. And he says, you know, he, I mean, that means, for instance, if I maintain my weight, like I'm, I don't know, 210, 215, I maintained it now, that's pounds for, you know, 10, 20 years, I'm maintaining my weight to effectively 
balancing intake to expenditure perfectly. Because if I'm off by 1%, so I eat 30, say 3000 calories a day, I don't know, 2,500 calories a day, 1% of that would be 25 calories. And if I store that 25 calories as fat, then we do that same calculation you did. Let's make it 20 calories because it's easily. So you take those 3,500 calories, uh, you divide it by 20 and you find out that you're gaining about a pound of fat a year every hundred, half a year. So it's two pounds of fat a year. It's a very simple calculation. And there's no, no assumptions involved, no assumptions about how much of the energy you eat is burned up in exercise or is burned, you know, transformed by the gut microbiome or is not digested as fiber. You're just saying, look, if every day I store 20 calories as fat, 1% of what I eat is stored as fat, I'm going to gain two pounds of fat a year. Or the, conversely, if I'm gaining two pounds of fat a year, that means on average, I'm storing 20 calories a day. So the chapter and why we get fat, my second book, I, there was a chapter called 20 calories a day. Um, if you store 20 calories a day for 10 years, that's 20 pounds, right? If you do that for 20 years, that's 40 pounds. So you're, you're overshooting by 1%. Now, we don't actually have technology that could measure energy balance by 1%. They didn't in 1924, which is the point Dubois was making, that you needed to accurately match intake to expenditure better than any technology that existed then. And the technology hasn't really gotten any better in that way. It's just a very hard measurement to make. And yet, we're supposed to be able to pull this off. And when people talk about theories of obesity and the, the conventional wisdom is the reason we get fat is because the food environment um, dysregulates our ability and our brain to match intake to expenditure to sort of trigger the necessary compensatory effects in our body so that if we eat more, we expend more. And if we expend more, we eat. Um, the idea that that can do it to perfect accuracy is sort of insane. So you go back to the 1920s, 1930s, when some very smart researchers were writing about this, they were saying, look, the question isn't why do some people get fat in this food environment? Because we all eat more food than we probably are programmed to eat. That's all of you know, the whole artistry of cooking is about making the food taste better than it would if you just, you know, killed deer and didn't even have the opportunity to burn it. And then on top of that, you've got cocktails and beer and desserts and snacks and all these other things. So all of us are clearly getting more food than we might eat otherwise. Why is it only some of us get fat and some don't? How do the ones who stay lean stay lean if they're the way the job is supposedly done by this matching of intake to expenditure? So that's the kind of way just asking those questions and in the case for keto, I talk about this. I mean, it's just, these are not the kinds of questions that obesity researchers ever ask. 